Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there listening from both of us. We're happy to be here with you and talking about some football ahead of a massive football week, not just weekend as we record this a little earlier than normal on a Tuesday afternoon. Greg, the rare win for the local professional football team on Sunday. Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of fun to watch. I, you know, as many know, I watch Red Zone on Sunday and the way the game was going back and forth. And, you know, obviously uh, they showed a lot of it in the fourth quarter. There were some crazy fourth quarters this week, this past Sunday. But um, really good win. Hey, a couple of things. They won and they scored more than 30 points. The things that never happen anymore. Right. <laughs> multiple, <laughs> on multiple fronts. So, yes, it was uh, refreshing on a on a variety for a variety of different reasons. But, you know, Greg, for Titans fans in particular, they're they're trying to figure out what their football team has and does not have, right, as we kind of touched right. on last week with some of the younger pieces and parts. Uh, and for this offense, right, any, any, increment, any, any incremental progress matters here. And I thought just on a like a meta level before we talk about actual football and schemes that the setbacks didn't crater them the way that we have seen them be cratered by a pick six, for example, or an 80-yard kickoff return. Right. Uh, if I told you Will Levis got sacked eight times in a game where both of those things happened, you would have told me that the Titans got blown out because that's the only logical explanation, surely, other than what ended up happening, which is one of the weirder football games of my life. But from, from the offensive standpoint, what did you like about what you saw from them on tape this week? Well, I think a couple of things stood out. Number one, and we've talked about this, that they have to be a running football team. Or, or let's put it this way. They have to have enough volume and enough success where the run game is, is able to sustain offense for them. And I think that was that was a strong point. And, and Tony Pollard, very quietly, is having an outstanding season. I think he's fifth or sixth or seventh. I, I, I could easily look at the numbers anybody can but I think he has about 800 yards rushing he for the most part he's played extremely well let's put it this way he's been everything they could have asked for when when they signed him he's he's clearly been a positive all season wouldn't you agree I mean without question uh it's yeah. it, it, it does not make sense that he's almost had a thousand yard season for his much as they've struggled but uh, he's done a lot of the heavy lifting on, on on that front himself as well Greg but I did think that they blocked things up pretty nicely for him on the run game and and you know the thing that really stands out is that they, they ran a lot of trap plays and traps are something that are coming back in vogue in the league because they really present angles and leverage for offensive linemen and they ran a trap I think it was early in the game they ran a I think the touchdown run the 10 yarder was a trap play if I'm not mistaken um and they they one thing that uh, Bill Callahan has always liked, which you saw, was he likes to pull his linemen. So you saw some center guard pull schemes that were effective. Um, so the, the run blocking was strong. Now, I'm sure most people want to hear about Will Levis, um, because obviously that's the, the big decision as we go forward, as this team plays the rest of its, its schedule. And, you know, barring anything unforeseen, it's probably going to get a top 10 pick in the draft and maybe even higher. Um, and I think Levis, again... Is, is continuing to play with a better sense of poise and composure. Um, you know, it's odd because the offensive line in pass pro was not very good this week. I thought Latham had one of his worst games in quite a while. Um, he really struggled with his former Alabama teammate, uh, Will Anderson. He struggled a couple of times as well with Daniil Hunter. Um, but he had one of his worst games. But there were seven sacks in the first half, and... I don't know how Coach Callahan sees it. I was trying to look really, really carefully. I, I, To me, with maybe the exception of one, I'm not sure there was a clean throw for Levis. Now, could he have thrown it away or thrown it at somebody's feet? That's a different question, you know, and maybe that's what they want him to do uh, rather than, of course, take a sack and lose yardage. But, uh, but I didn't think that he missed a lot. Now, I will say just as we continue our discussion of Levis, that there's two things that he clearly needs to get better at. And, and he, I think he's starting to get a better feel, but they still need improvement. One is he needs just to get quicker with his elimination and isolation from the pocket. He still shows a tendency at times to be a beat slow in coming off what's not there and getting to what is there. Uh, that's what elimination and isolation means. The other thing that I think 
is something that he clearly needs to work on and needs improvement is pocket movement. He needs to develop a better feel for navigating within the pocket, not trying to run out of the pocket, navigating within the pocket so he can reset his throwing platform to deliver the ball. Because he misses an opportunity here and there because he doesn't really have that trait at, at the necessary level. But overall, I, I still you're seeing incremental improvement in his game. Yeah, and, and to your point about how he's navigating the pocket or rather not navigating the pocket in certain circumstances because he did run directly into Will Anderson's arms at least twice of the eight sacks that he uh, of, that he took. It's, it's like, Greg, you know, to your point that you made, uh, if not last week, a couple of weeks ago, the time that he missed and how much that kind of delayed some of the developmental stuff that we're seeing now in week 12 and heading into week 13 – I think he just kind of needs to to assess how how mobile he actually is because it just seems like he has an unrealistic sense of all right. I see a little bit of daylight there. I see a slight crease. I can get there before the defender does. Or there was a the play where he rolled out as well on the sideline where he clearly thought he was going to be able to beat the defender and then very much did not uh, in taking a sack. I just think that he has to kind of he's just got to play more to be able to properly assess his own capabilities from that standpoint specifically. Well, here's here's how I'll respond to that, because I think you 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 raised a point that I think is really interesting. There's two kinds of mobility. See, if, if he can get out of the pocket and run straight, he's he's actually pretty good at that. For a big man who's probably overbuilt, he actually is fast in a straight line. That's a totally different trait than moving within the pocket. Okay? Think of guys like Tom Brady. Tom Brady probably ran a 5-6-40, but Tom Brady had a tremendous feel for moving within the pocket, navigating space, finding a quieter spot to deliver the ball. That's what Will Levis has to work on, and that's where his body stiffness gets in the way a little bit. That's where the fact that he's so bulked up, he's not a loose athlete in terms of his core and his overall movement. Now, again, I don't know if that can be worked on. I don't know what he does in the offseason as far as training, but he needs to become a little bit of a looser athlete. He's stiff. Um, and and there's a lot of guys who are straight line fast, as you know, but they're stiff when it comes to sort of their hips and their core and the ability to move laterally. His stiffness is one thing that prevents him from sort of moving within the pocket. But that's something he's going to have to improve at or or – You'll see a lot of this. You'll see him getting sacked a lot, uh, which doesn't mean he can't be a good player, but you want to be able to avoid those. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I, I appreciate the distinction because I think the audience can see in their mind's eye exactly what you're articulating there and, and how he still has, I won't say quite miles to go on that front, but he's still got a pretty good way to continue to yep. try and develop that sense of, what how much pressure he's actually feeling in the pocket he needs flexib- to- i mean and maybe he's getting it i don't know what his training regimen is but he needs serious flexibility training yeah which is uh not something that people would necessarily uh think about a quarterback right, right off the bat, right. but it absolutely matters to your i point. mean I, i'm not comparing him to joe burrow clearly joe burrow is probably playing the best quarterback in the league right now But think about the way Burrow navigates the pocket and how easily he he moves. It looks effortless. Don't you agree when you watch him? Oh, absolutely. It looks effortless. Now, Levis will never look effortless, but you can get better. Yeah. No, it's it's to to your point. Like we talked about last week, he has the ability. He's not he's not he's not unfixable or these qualities that he has are not something that can't continue to be at least refined, if not outright corrected. Right. Um, as, as he works to become a more well-rounded player at the position, which is ultimately what they're just trying to achieve uh, from a standpoint on the, they had a couple of big plays. They've had sure six did. explosive pl- passing plays in the last three weeks, Greg, and three of them came in this game between the 38 yarder to NWI the 63-yarder to Calvin Ridley, and then what just looked like, from my perspective, you might tell me if I'm wrong on this, but a coverage bust on the Chigaconquo 70-yard uh, one-play touchdown drive that they had in the fourth quarter. It is, it is though, good to see them at least have that explosive element back in their passing game because that's something that they've lacked for years at this point. 
Yeah, and the uh, the Westbrook Heaney touchdown and the Ridley sixty three yarder both came out of empty sets. Um, see, now the sixty three yarder is is that that's what Levis can do, okay? Because he sat on his back foot and he threw the ball almost sixty yards in the air. There's, you know, that's that's a trait the, the the ability to just sit on your back foot and deliver the ball with that kind of distance. And and he obviously laid it right out there for him. Uh, that was a really well designed play, by the way. Um, now I don't I don't know whether they anticipated that specific coverage. They got cover four, and the three man route concept because it was essentially dagger. Um, um, and 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 then Boyd, who was number three, it was quads. It was it was an empty set. And when we say quads, there were four receivers to one side of the formation, which you don't normally see in empty. Normally it's three receivers to one side and two to the other, but they had quads. They had four to one side. Um, so they ran dagger, and then they had number three Boyd running at the backside safety. So what you ended up getting was Ridley, who was the number two receiver, meaning he's second from the outside he's the number two receiver he ended up running the deep post versus ward who was the quarter safety to that side so that's the matchup you want and that was a big time throw you mentioned the the uh chiggy touchdown i looked at that play over and over and over and it's probably too much in the weeds to explain what happened there was a bust okay clearly they were not not meant to allow Chiggy just to run free on, on his crosser, but it was a very interesting coverage concept that started with the fact that Ridley was the boundary X, the single receiver to the short side, and they essentially played a two-man concept to him, meaning the corner let him run by him, tailgated him, undercut him, and the safety to that side rotated hard over the top, so they were essentially doubling Ridley on that play. Uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun to watch, certainly, and we haven't seen Chickaconquo. You hit the afterburners on that one. Yeah, I mean, Ed, Jig, Jig's a big, strong man that can move yeah. fast. We just haven't seen him. I mean, honest to God, Greg, he hasn't had a play like that since, I think, 2022 against the Chiefs with Malik Willis. It's been that long since he's had that kind of an explosive play in a game. Uh, certainly. To the defensive side of the ball, because they played a really nice game. Really well. nice game. It's a good defense. Yeah, and and the way that they – the Texans specifically, if they don't have that run game as a part as – a, as a huge part of their offense, and not quite the same way that we talk about with the Titans, but there are some parallels there, it really was a struggle for them to get anything accomplished. And they kept going back to Mixon, uh, whether they should have or not in this game. Yeah, uh, and Nixon ended up with 14 for 22. There was no room to run at all. I thought Simmons and and uh, Sweat inside played really, really well. I thought Murray flashed throughout the game. I don't know what you thought. Um, I don't know if, if any of the coaches talked about that, but I thought Murray... Callahan did it his Monday press conference. He highlighted him specifically beyond yeah. just the interception that he obviously had. No, I thought he played fast with a quick trigger. He made plays with pursuit range and speed. Um, obviously, um, and he made a big time, put, putting aside the interception, a great play, but he made a big time pass defense play with less than a minute and a half remaining in the game. I'm sure you remember that play as well. Um, but I just thought he really flashed throughout the game. Um, so he stood out to me. I'm glad Callahan mentioned it. You know, obviously they're studying the tape and, and you know, they're, they're studying in more detail than I am because they have position coaches who do that, you know, but, um, but he really stood out and, um, you know, the D-line's playing really, really well. This was a game where, and, and I made a note of this, which I thought was really interesting, um, and I'm trying to find my note, but all 11, you know, starters, and I'm counting the starters as in their nickel defense because right. they're basically a nickel defense, um, all 11 of those guys played 80% or more of the defensive snaps with four players playing every snap. Um, and that's... That's rare. I mean, Murray and Baker played every snap. Safety Brown and corner Baker played every snap. That's that's a rarity, you know, because normally teams play a lot of guys on defense. Yeah. And um, and then Simmons, I thought, made two big plays late in the fourth quarter. The first was in run defense in the red zone, and the second was the sack with less than a minute and a half remaining, you know, deep in, in uh, Texans territory. Um, 
And I, I tell you, another guy I thought acquitted himself really well was Worley, who obviously found out yeah. he was starting, what, about a minute before the game? Uh, I Literally 45 minutes before yeah. the game. Imani Hooker apparently could not stand up without throwing up, and they determined that at 11.15, I think, is when we got that injury update. And, I mean, for a guy that had to step in and probably, you know, I mean, he's been around the league, so he's, you know, familiar with a lot of schemes and all that. Um, he's played corner, he's played safety, but he certainly didn't hurt them, Buck. He certainly didn't hurt, and he made a couple of plays, too. Yeah, and and they even survived him going down for a period of time. Julius Wood was out there. They were down, they're down to their fourth and fifth safety yeah. game, and uh, certainly we know the corner situation. Worth noting for for the audience that may not have heard it during the week, Chidobi Awuzie is, is expected to start practicing again tomorrow so that is at least a step in the right direction as they try and get a little uh, a little healthier in the back end of this defense but to your point about the defensive line Greg uh Arden Key was on the radio show a couple of weeks ago and he talked about how much the coaching staff has helped them kind of scheme one-on-one -on -one opportunities for yeah. Jeff for Harold for for sweat in certain circumstances um Harold obviously having I think an impact one of one of the more impactful games that Harold Landry has had this season uh with and they're you know they're running a lot of stunts and games up front as well and they just have two two not world beaters probably as strong but two really quality players on the inside impacting the game and, and to your point about uh the snap counts we we noticed that too up in the press yeah. box and they've been doing this thing where they just put a bunch of reserves in a little before the two minute warning and basically take all the frontline players out so that they get to catch their breath before during the two minute warning and leading up to it so that they're ready to finish out the stretch, which I thought was an interesting strategy. Yeah. But I mean, it's their defense. I mean, and keep in mind, they're playing with Brownlee, a rookie Baker, who's a free agent at corner. And, uh, you know, these guys are acquitting themselves. Uh, you know, I don't know what people thought, but on that, that first touchdown, that was actually on Brownlee. But, you know, because I know a lot of people, because of the way it looked, maybe yeah. on TV, people might have thought it was Baker, but it was Brownlee because they were playing cover four. And Brownlee's responsible for the for number one vertical, and Stover was number one vertical. He squeezed inside with number two Schultz. And again, only he could tell you why he did that, but that he actually made the mistake on that play. It's the second time we've seen him make that kind of a mistake on a similar play, Greg. And I don't know if you can recall the uh, in the Chargers game where it was Murray who looked like he was supposed to be the player in coverage there that just lost the tight end. I, think, I don't remember if it was Disley or not that caught the touchdown, but it looked like a similar concept or at least that Brownlee made a similar mistake and how the co how the coverage essentially got beat there. He was just out of position. They've, they've yeah. had that struggle in the red zone um, to some extent all year long yeah but then you know he came back from it he he obviously made the pick which was just I mean watching that tape I'm thinking to myself what's going on with CJ Stroud I mean rarely rarely do you see a quarterback and he made a couple of good throws in the fourth quarter I don't want to take anything away from those throws but rarely do you see a quarterback kind of lose his precise ball location. And this this was not the only game that's been like that for C.J. Stroud this year. I mean, he's missing easy throws. I mean, the interception by Brownlee, taking nothing away from Brownlee, that was just snag flat. And he threw the such a poor throw on a throw that is an easy throw. And, you know, so... I, Whatever's going on with him, they, they got to work that through because he's really struggling and he's just playing fast. Everything seems fast to him right now. Yeah. I mean, he's they, they have not had the best year in pass protection in front of him. No. The Titans haven't had an overwhelmingly great pass rush, but they did find ways to uh, disrupt and, and, and try and make and did. They killed the right side of that all line with Howard and Shaq Mason. They, they throughout the game, they, they caused all kinds of problems for those two guys. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a reassuring sign for a Titans team that's been trying to figure out the pass rush uh, all year long. And again, they didn't win the turnover battle, but they did cause they did cause enough problems for the. Texans. I mean, you hit it on the head when we started, Buck. Interception return for a touchdown. Eight quarterback sacks, seven in the first half. Starting the game with an eighty-yard kickoff return. You usually don't win those games. No, no, and honestly, <laughs> the thought occurred to me watching that game from the press box. You know, if the Titans were a better team, like one of the real quality teams in the AFC, this this would be a, a pretty sound ass kicking. Yeah, yeah. Part of the Texans. Uh, but that's uh that's you know, it was an interesting 
interesting dynamic, a fun I, game, I have roller a roller coaster, certainly. Let me ask you a question, because I don't listen to the press conferences, and I don't know if it was talked about. Sure. Did anybody talk about the Levis interception? Uh, he did not. Callahan was definitely asked about it. Will, uh, Will said that he made the incorrect read on Sunday night. I wonder what you made of it, because Callahan didn't give us a ton of detail. Yeah, I, I watched that play over and over, and I was trying, you know, just so you know what what the play was, okay? They ran a very common concept. They ran uh, slant flat to the boundary and double glance to the field, okay? Now, the normal rule for that, the normal rule, and nothing's 100%, but the normal rule is if it's single high safety, you throw the slant flat. If it's too high safety, you throw to the double glance side. So it was too high safety. So he threw to the double glance side. And I wonder if he just did that, at, you know, wrote mechanically. Yeah. Because clearly it was not there. I mean, yeah. clearly. And, and Ward didn't do anything special, by the way. He was just sitting right. In fact, the ball was way behind. Uh, I forget who the intended receiver was. The ball was way behind the intended receiver. I mean, if he threw it to the intended receiver he would have hit ward between the numbers yeah so that's why i asked if, if anybody spoke about it because it was just an odd play it was one of those plays that you know left me scratching my head and and i was curious what levis saw to do that yeah he he didn't uh levis his answers at press conferences he's, he's slowly becoming more of an nfl quarterback that way they're getting less and less descriptive as uh, well as he's learning he's learning he sure, he sure is on a variety of different fronts to his credit. And yeah, you know, yeah. doesn't, <laughs> he's doesn't learning. benefit him at all to, to explain all. No, it doesn't benefit places. him at all to tell us why he made a bad throw. <laughs> Certainly not. Uh, not, not in my experience anyway. Um, this is going to be a fun week of football. And I know that you are early in your preparations for the NFL matchup show, but I wonder if there was not something, of course, you can watch the NFL matchup show on ESPN, on ESPN Plus, you can set your DVRs as I do and watch it on demand that way. Uh, the Cardinals are no longer in the lead of the NFC no. uh, West that way. They have a huge game against the Vikings. Uh, yeah. Seahawks were able to climb into the lead of that division that's been hugely competitive, Greg. Um, that's probably my favorite game on the board. I wonder what your highlight of Vikings, yeah. Well, we've got two games that I think are are fascinating. Uh, full segment game will be Eagles and Ravens. That That's probably the best, because obviously, so people understand, we don't do the Thanksgiving Day games or the Friday game between the Chiefs and the Raiders. So we're just doing the Sunday slate. Um, so Eagles-Ravens is, is a really fascinating game. Um, I think that Steelers-Bengals, because it's division, and even though this is really the Bengals season, and, and Burrow's playing really high-level football, uh, and obviously the Steelers are coming off a loss. So this is actually a very, very big game. And you know that division, Buck. That division is people do not like each other in that division. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the status We're talking on a Tuesday. I don't know what Brock Purdy's status is. Normally 49ers' bills would be – we're going to do it in the show because the bills have won seven in a row. Um, but, you know, that's – who knows? I mean, uh, it's – it's in, unless – Unless we find, well, we'll know obviously before Sunday, but, yeah. you know, that game loses a little bit of luster. But still, the Bills have won seven in a row, and they're playing pretty good football. Yeah, no, the Niners uh, have just have, have really struggled this year. And they've had a lot of injuries in situations like that. And Purdy was, you know, at least some level of questionable going into the game, even though I know Shanahan was not expressing any kind of lack of confidence that he would play in this past weekend's game. But uh, certainly a lot game. of... Another game that's really, it may not be a national marquee game in the minds of many, but Chargers at Falcons is a very big game as well. Yeah, Falcons holding on to a very slim lead in that division. And, uh, you know, it's funny to just see how, I, mean, I know they're literally, tw uh, they're not twins in, in Jim and John Harbaugh, but how identical their damn football teams are watching that Monday night football game last night, or at least who they're trying to be, Greg. Uh, I know that they poached a lot of personnel and players and coaches from the Ravens organization, um, and that that ended up being less competitive down the stretch. But that that Chargers team is is interesting for a variety of different reasons because he's basically changed their whole whole ethos there. Oh, for sure. And that was a tough game the other night. Obviously, they lost. They lost. But um, yeah, the Ravens Eagles. That's that's fascinating because the Eagles have also won seven in a row. So. You know they're they're a fascinating team right now, and and Barkley he's on track to gain two thousand yards rushing. So. Yeah, the leading uh, rusher in the NFL right now, and that John Mara clip uh, circulating from Hard Knocks again 
about saying, you know, I'd really be sick if Saquon ended up with the Eagles. And sure enough, he's ended up with the Eagles and they're having a lot of success. I mean, you could argue he's the front runner for MVP right now. I know everybody it always thinks it's a quarterback award, but, you know, you, you could make a very valid argument for Saquon Barkley. Certainly the leading rusher in the NFL, Derrick Henry, who he'll go not head to head against necessarily, but their teams will go head to head on Sunday. That will be a fascinating matchup for sure. Uh, buddy, have a fantastic Thanksgiving. I appreciate you accommodating a, an early taping this week. Always good to talk some shop with you and uh, hope you and the family have an awesome one. Now, you too, Buck. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'll do a little work on Thursday and Friday. You know, you, you got to, I mean, there's a lot of games. There's a lot of games I got to look at, you know. Well, the, the damn Titans are having practice, a full thing of practice, 9.30 to 1 on, on uh, Thursday. So I'm not necessarily thrilled with them. But either way, we'll be working. Well, you'll be working. Hey, I know you. You'll be working. <laughs> no doubt about it. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thanks, Buck.